indictment of the defendant, Laverne, on those two counts of first-degree murder, Mickey Shunick and Lisa Pate. If convicted, Laverne would face the death penalty, so he decided to negotiate. Part of the deal was that if he was, was to confess and to lead investigators to where her remains were, that the death penalty would be taken off the table. Laverne offered his version of what happened that fateful night. He saw this beautiful blonde on her bicycle late at night. She was heading home, and he saw it as an opportunity. He hit her bicycle, throwing her off. An encounter occurred at that point. We will never know uh, how it came to be that she entered his vehicle, but suffice to say, the fact is she was inside of his vehicle. At some point, as they were traveling away from this site, she began to attempt to escape. Laverne pulled out a knife. Mickey sprayed him with mace. I grabbed her arm, trying to get the mace out of her hand. And I guess when she grabbed the knife, she started stabbing me. And I just, uh, you know, I was just, you know, I lost my mind. He was able to wrestle the knife away from her. And in the midst of doing that, cut severely some tendons in his finger and his hand. He was able to get the knife from her and then proceeded to stab Mickey several times. Laverne thought Mickey was dead. After he drove 40 minutes to dump her body, he received the shock of his life. She popped up and stabbed me dead in my chest. And I was like, I was, I don't know if I was more freaked out about her stabbing or, or that fact that she was still alive. It shocked him, it, it stunned him but only momentarily because he quickly grabbed a gun that he had in his possession and then shot Mickey in the head at that point, and she was killed immediately. Laverne quickly stashed Mickey's body in an old cemetery so he could tend to his own life-threatening injuries. He ended up going to New Orleans to seek treatment so that no suspicion about the wounds would come up in this area. When he returned to Lafayette, Laverne threw Mickey's bike off a bridge and burned the rest of the evidence, including his truck. Then Laverne went back to the cemetery where he left Mickey. He actually then pulled her body deeper into the wooded area, dug a shallow grave, and then buried her there. Mickey fought extremely hard for her life, and she was instrumental in actually helping us solve the case. Because without her fighting and without that will to live, he wouldn't have received those injuries, and he wouldn't have had to seek medical treatment. With Laverne's confession, there was only one piece of information police needed to know. I went to the woods right there. You go maybe 50 to uh, 50, 75 feet to the woods and stuff, and uh, she's she buried right there. The day they did find Mickey's body was a very tough day on so many levels. Professionally, it was tough, and personally, I'd gotten very close to the Shunick family, and I knew all they wanted was to bring Mickey home. Brandon Laverne also pled guilty to the murder of Lisa Pate. He received a life sentence for that crime and another life sentence for the murder of Mickey Shunick. The Shunick family got what a lot of families don't ever get, and that's closure. And closure, in a sense, they know where their daughter is. My opinion of what Mickey did that night was that she was an absolute warrior. If she had not done those things, if she had not launched at him and stabbed him repeatedly and put the fight up that she had, it may well have been an unsolved homicide. Since Mickey's murder, her sister has worked to assist other families facing similar tragedies. Mickey's sister, Charlie, and I and some of her friends are uh, working on starting an organization that is gonna help families by telling them how to organize your presence on social media. Mickey's final act of bravery has become her lasting legacy. I know for a lot of little girls, she's a role model now. You fight, you fight back, and Mickey wasn't willing to give up and apply that to any part of your life. That's pretty darn courageous. If a little five foot one girl can show that much courage, I think we all can do our little part on that. So. Coming up, a pretty co-ed leaves a college party and steps into a nightmare. We were really familiar with the neighborhood. It made sense that she would think that it was safe to just walk home.
The future was bright for New Mexico State University student Katie Sepich. She wanted to do something significant and something that would change the world. Katie's life did bring permanent change to the criminal justice system by paying the ultimate price. I think every parent that loses a child doesn't want their child forgotten. But it's more than that for us. Katie Sepich was raised in the small town of Carlsbad, New Mexico. Her parents admit their daughter was a handful. Katie was always challenging. She was very opinionated, very strong-willed, but incredibly loving. Katie was just full of life and full of fun, and she was had lots and lots of friends. I just thought that she was such a cool person. She was someone that I wanted to be like in a lot of ways. When it was time for college, Katie had options, but she decided to stay close to home. Katie chose to go to New Mexico State University because she got an incredible academic scholarship, and also that's where her friends were going. Katie just thrived. She was excited about graduating and was ready to move to the next challenge, and that was her graduate degree. While studying for her master's in business administration, Katie and some friends lived in a rented home in an upscale neighborhood of Las Cruces. It was on a quiet street, but close enough to campus that we could go straight to the school. Katie thrived at New Mexico State. She had a job at a local restaurant, and she started dating a fellow student named Joe. Katie was very excited when she started her relationship with Joe. She really felt like Joe was the person that she would end up marrying, perhaps. But on the Saturday of Labor Day weekend 2003, everything changed. She had worked that evening till 11 o'clock. She got off of her shift and she went home and took a shower. Around midnight, Katie planned to meet up with her boyfriend at a party. Things didn't go well. As we understand it, she walked into a room and saw Joe with another girl. And that really, really upset her. She just became enraged. Katie stormed out without her purse, her cell phone, or her keys. The walk from the house that we were partying at to our house was not far at all. It was probably not even a mile. And so we were really familiar with the neighborhood. It made sense that she would think that it was safe to just walk home. But the next morning, Katie was nowhere to be found. That's pretty much when I started calling all of our friends. I called the hospitals, and so when none of that happened, I, I finally decided I needed to call her mom. Her father and our friends felt like maybe she had just gotten so angry that she was trying to scare Joe and was kind of hiding out. But I knew immediately when I got that phone call that there was something terribly wrong. Katie's father got in the car and raced toward Las Cruces. In the meantime, police received word of a horrifying discovery. Hikers in a remote area happened upon the remains of a young woman. The body was mostly nude, face down. Her pants had been dropped between her, her legs. The burn marks on her body were a result of an accelerant that had been poured on her back uh, in what we think was an attempt to burn the evidence. It appeared that the body was taken to this location and dumped. When Dave Sepich arrived at Katie's house, his worst nightmare was waiting. There was a, uh, a, a police officer and a chaplain uh, from the, the Las Cruces Police Department there to, to meet me. And of course, as soon as I saw him, I, I knew it wasn't good. Well, they asked me to go with them to identify her. And uh, so I did, and that was a very, very difficult time. Uh, it, something I never dreamed I'd ever do. He later told me when they pulled back that sheet and he had to look at her precious face, bruised, and with a horrible expression of pain on her face that he said he fell to his knees and he asked God to take him to. A week after Katie's murder, friends and family members turned out to pay her a tearful goodbye. It was very comforting for us as a family to have that many people be here for us. It literally turned into a celebration of her life. 
With Katie laid to rest, her family was determined to bring her killer to justice. They enlisted the help of the media. We know that Katie made it home. She realizes she doesn't have her keys, she doesn't have a way to get in, her roommate's not there, so she decides to break into her room window. The bed window was situated behind a hedge, which obscured the view from the street, and the marks on her backside were consistent with being caused by the stucco on the house, most likely during a struggle. Katie fought. She fought hard. And underneath her fingernails was the skin and the blood of the man that had brutalized her. We were told that a DNA profile had been extracted from that and uploaded into the national forensic database called CODIS. We were pretty naive about the process because we kind of thought it was like watching television. You know, these cases get solved in an hour. They find DNA and they put it into the computer and a few minutes later, somebody's picture prints out. But there would be no Hollywood ending to this manhunt. Because we had that DNA, there would always be hope that we would be able to identify her killer. But months went by and then years and it became very discouraging. Coming up, grinding frustration. We might never have an answer. Then, breakthrough. It was a gift to her and to her family and friends that her killer had finally been discovered. Katie Sepich was a promising grad student at New Mexico State University. But late one night in 2003, after a fight with her boyfriend, Katie stormed off from a party and became the victim in a brutal murder mystery. She was strangled. She was raped. She had the DNA under her fingernails because of the way she fought back. For three years, Katie's parents held out hope that the DNA would lead authorities to their daughter's killer. Then, out of nowhere, police got a hit. We do have a suspect who is in jail at this time on other charges. The suspect was Gabriel Avila, a 27-year-old Mexican national with an extensive history of petty crime. The year after Katie's murder, he was convicted of burglary. He had bonded out pending sentencing, and when he bonded out, he took off, he left. Avila was ultimately captured and sent to prison. With his conviction, his DNA was then entered into the National Criminal Database and checked against other crimes. A match linked him to the murder of Katie Sepich. Avila was interrogated in prison and confessed. Today, we are rejoicing that it looks like we have the person who killed our daughter. It was a gift to her and to her family and friends that her killer had finally been discovered. Avila was charged with first degree murder, first degree kidnapping, rape. He pled guilty to every single charge. There was no plea bargain in this case whatsoever. It seemed Avila wanted to clear his conscience. When Katie left that party and she was walking home, Gabriel Avila was out in the middle of the night trying to find drugs when he saw her walking. When she eventually stopped at her residence, he stopped as well and asked her if she needed any help, to which Katie said no, she didn't need any help. And then he seized upon the opportunity to commit the murder. He was sentenced to a life sentence, which means a minimum of 30 years. And on top of that, the judge added 39 years or the uh, sexual assault. He actually spoke to the parents afterwards. He wanted to explain what had happened. When we spoke to Gabriel Avila face to face, he did apologize to us for taking Katie from us. He said that it was the drugs that caused him to do that. 
Still, after their years of frustration, Dave and Jayanne wanted to see changes made regarding use of DNA in criminal cases. At the time of Katie's murder, DNA testing could only be done following a conviction. The Sepiches proposed that taking DNA samples after arrest would help solve cases faster. Their efforts resulted in legislation known as Katie's Law. What Katie's Law entails is when an individual is arrested and placed into jail, they have a Q-tip in a box. It, they simply do a few strokes inside the cheek of the mouth and place it into a tube and send it to the laboratory. The bill made it all the way to the White House. President Obama signed into law the Katie Sepich Enhanced DNA Collection Act that was passed by Congress in December of 2012. It's a tool that our country should have been using a long time ago, and, and there would be a lot of people that were never in prison if, if they had had arrest DNA. Katie, shortly before she was murdered, had told my wife that she wasn't sure exactly what she wanted to do, but she wanted to do something significant, literally because of Katie, in which her sacrifice we're changing the world. One of the favorite things Katie used to say is that she woke up every day expecting something wonderful to happen. She was joyful, she was optimistic, and she loved with her whole heart. And I want people to remember Katie just like that.